I played a Toyota commercial in church just now. Um, it'll be amazing. So I have some friends on Facebook that know that family and said the Russian government actually tried to keep them even from adopting her. And now, you know, her influence is influencing thousands and even maybe millions of people seeing that um, life is not about ease. And there are times that we really need to pay attention to people around us because God has not... Listen, if my mentor Dave Daniel was here, he used to get on to me all the time because he would say, people post, all I need is Jesus. And he would say, that's not true. Absolutely not true. And I'm like, well, what do you mean that's not true? All we need is Jesus. He said, because God made us to need other people. The reason that God said it's not good for man to be alone. If all you needed was Jesus, then God wouldn't have had to create anybody else but you. But we need each other, and we're here to help each other. And by the way, if you've never heard that, uh, uh, you'll struggle with that. Because I did. When I first heard it, I'm like, but all I need is Jesus. I saw it on a bumper sticker. But God's given you other people. And the truth is, you have an enemy who will do everything he can to keep you from other believers. He'll do it by people being imperfect. By the way, let me let you know who will let you down as you get to know them. Everyone. Everyone. At some point, you'll be like, wow, I didn't know they were like that. People come to my small group, and they come the first week. They're like, oh, pastor, he's such a godly, incredible teacher. It's just amazing. And then week two, they're like, you know, I'm a little concerned. By week three, they're going, who hired him, and how is he still here, right? Right? And so as you get to know people, you realize there's times they will not say and do because they're human. They're human. Now, one of the neat things to me is, as we talk today about healing helpers, is one of the things I see God doing in our church right now is people coming to Christ, people wanting to get baptized, people wanting to take those steps of faith. Because of those of you who've reached out, even during this difficult time, you've reached out to other people. Let them know you care. Let them know that you matter. Now, here's our series verse. Then the Lord said to him, talking about Moses, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. It became a snake, and he ran from it. You know, even Moses got tired. Do you ever feel tired? How many of you have ever felt tired in, during the day, right? Everybody, right? And you ever try to do too much? And what happens to people, and this happens, and I think the enemy uses this. The enemy will put you in a position, make you think you're the only one, and then you'll finally go, I got burned out once, I'm not helping anymore. And Satan goes, yes, it's exactly what I wanted. Don't do anything else. Sit on the sideline, don't help anybody, don't encourage anybody, don't help anybody find their way out of hell into heaven. You just sit aside and do it. Now let me tell you what God does. God will send people into your life to help you. Now, we typically, pastors like to talk about the financial part of that. Let's partner together as we give financially to help. And that's true. That's one of them. But the truth is, we help people physically, maybe helping them with their needs, whether they need food or whatever. Okay, But we also can help people emotionally. You know, in our church, we have grief share, for example. One of the things to help people as they overcome grief but then even spiritually, we need each other to grow. Today, we're going to talk about this idea of providing for others, preparing others, and partnering with others. I went with things that you had to go, to say. God wants us to be this to other people. Now, years ago, I taught school, and you're going to discover very quickly why I, they won't let me teach school anymore. We were teaching about inertia. I was a science teacher. Um, I taught biology in high school for a while, a few other things. Taught in-school suspension. That was my funnest. Taught driver's ed. That was great, having kids cry seven periods a day. But my favorite lesson was inertia, to which any student that had me will say these words, inertia, dude, because that's what I always said when I said the word inertia. I felt like dude was a perfect mix. So one day I took them out to the bus, the school bus that was sitting outside, and I got the maintenance crew to give me the keys. That was also a mistake on their part. I put the bus in neutral. 
And I'm pretty sure it was Brian Moon, who is now a pastor, that I said to, hey, go push that bus. So he did his best, got behind the bus, pushed as hard as he could, and guess what happened? Nothing. He could not push a bus. And then I said to all the students, okay, all of you go and push the bus. And they began pushing the bus, and I said, now, none of you would want to run in front of the bus right now because of inertia, to which they said, dude. Inertia is the idea that things get moving, but there's times in life that you and I get stuck. And we need other people to come alongside us in the burdens and the trials and the struggles to help us push through it. Sometimes that's physically, sometimes that's spiritually, and sometimes that's emotionally. And look at the story of Moses, and all through his journey, you will see people who helped him. So today we're going to talk about how others help us to accomplish God's will. How others help us to accomplish God's will. And if you work at the Space Center, you've seen this poster. Teamwork makes the dream work. They don't actually believe it. They just put it on a wall. It's not actually down the hall, but it's on the wall, right? And so you get a manager who says, oh, I believe in teamwork. And then you ask him a question. He goes, be quiet and go to your office, right? So here's the first thing. You, that was a little too true. Was that a little too true? I got a few people at the Space Center that are about to die right now. They're thinking of their bosses. All right. Number one, people can help provide for our needs. Then Moses went back to Jethro. You know, Jethro makes me think of a story, Dave. Uh, it's about a man named Jed. Have you heard it? He's a poor mountaineer. He barely kept his family fed. One day, shooting at some food, up through the ground, bubbling crude. Oil, that is, black gold, Texas tea. First thing you know, Jed's a millionaire. Next thing you know, his kinfolk, you know what they said to him? Move away from there. They said, California's the place you ought to be. So they loaded up a truck, moved to Beverly Hills, swimming pools, movie stars. Man, just a great story. So every time I hear the name Jethro, I think of that. So I thought this week I would just let you know what goes through my mind in the 12 seconds between one word and the next. So there you go. So Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, by the way, you'll never forget now who Moses' father-in-law was, right? So his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return, and if you say Ellie, you're in trouble. All right, let me return to my people in Egypt to see if any of them are staying alive, staying alive. Jethro said, go, I wish you well. So what did he do? He blessed him. Moses went back. He couldn't just leave. By the way, you know what Moses had when he came? He ran out of Egypt. Now, he was apparently dressed like an Egyptian, probably walked like an Egyptian, because the girl said when they met him, some Egyptian was there. And what did he do? He blessed him. Now, the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. What was God doing? God was saying, hey, you obey me and I will take care of it. You know, too often we want to say, God, I'm doing this, now bless it. And God says, no, no, be obedient and I'll bless it. Too often we go and we do our own thing and then we wonder why we're suffering, why we're struggling, why even in the middle of something that should be exciting or happy, we're depressed and discouraged because we just asked God to come on our journey. And you know what God says? No, no, you come on my journey. You be obedient to me. So he says, you can go back. So Moses took his wife and sons, and put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. By the way, who gave him the donkey? Who gave him the supplies? See, he had nothing when he came, and so now he's worked for his father-in-law, and these things he has gathered. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you, the power of to do, once again, do what I've called you to do. But I will harden his heart so he won't let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Now this is an amazing few words. Israel is my firstborn son. 
I told you, let my son go so he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go, so I'll kill your firstborn son. What was God saying? I know what's going to happen. I know what Pharaoh's going to do. Pharaoh's not going to do this, but I want you to tell him, you guys are my favorite. Now, back in the day this was written, first children really were the preferred and favored children, but let me tell you about my mother. One day, my sister and I were talking, and my sister said, you know, mom tells me I'm her favorite. And I looked at my sister, and I said, she tells me that, too. And then we talked to my brother, and he said, she tells me that, too. My mother is evil. She told all of her five children they were her favorite. God looks at Moses and says, 400 years you guys have been toiling away, but I've not forgotten about you. You ever feel forgotten about by God? Moses need to be reminded. I remember years ago going to a pastor's golf tournament when I had first started pastoring a church, and I was burned out and didn't know it. And here's how I discovered. I went to this golf tournament. They paid for it, which was good because I didn't have a dime. I went to this event. They handed me this big bag of stuff, and they said, this is yours. I'm like, oh, okay. And they, they gave me a golf. So I go out to the golf cart they gave me. They paired me up with somebody who could actually play golf. And it was CDs and books that I love from some of my favorite authors. There was candy. Candy's always good. And I cried. Because I was so overwhelmed that somebody who did not know me at all would go out of their way to just be a blessing. Have you ever had that happen? See, God will use people to provide for you. In Hebrews, it says it this way, and don't forget to do good and to share with others. I'm going to come back to that word share, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. This word in this verse for share with others is the word koinonia. Now, koinonia is a very broad word. You usually hear it in the, in the uh, definition fellowship. But the problem in English is fellowship has become us just kind of talking to each other. We're going, to have, we're going to have a fellowship after church. And usually if you're Baptist, it involves food, right? So we're going, to, we're going to fellowship together. And that means get one of those casserole plates and put stuff in it. But fellowship is bigger than just that. Fellowship is this idea of partnering together. It's the idea of sharing with each other. So he says, with that, God is pleased. And what's really cool about this, God is pleased, it means God is fully pleased. He's fully satisfied. When God sees us go out of our way to bless other people, I can almost, you get the sense in this verse, you ever been satisfied after a good dinner? And what do you do? You sit back and you, ah. I think when God sees us help somebody, bless somebody, go out of our way to help them physically, spiritually, emotional, to provide for them, he sits back, koinonia, fully satisfied. He says, that's great. That's wonderful. And we don't always feel that way because sometimes it's difficult to help people, but the truth is he's called us to do that. Is there anyone, here's your first challenge today, is there anyone God wants you to provide for? Now remember, that might be physical. Maybe it's providing food for somebody. Maybe it's going out of your way to provide soup for a sick friend. But it could also be spiritually. Maybe it's to encourage somebody. Tell them you're praying for them. Go out of your way to just in, in a little way. Maybe it's emotionally. Just to let them know you have their back. Maybe to write them a note. Somebody who came to church a few weeks ago said to me, I've not been to church in over a year, but I came because you wrote me a note and told me you missed me. And I'm like, that's all I had to do. I should have done that a year and a half ago. You never know what impact you're having on people, but ask God, God, would you make clear to me what I need to do for someone else? Number two, people prepare us for the next steps. People prepare us for the next steps. I'll never forget when I was in college, I was still trying to figure out what I was going to do. I was a biology major, secondary education major, and uh, getting my teaching degree. But yet I knew God wanted me to do something in ministry, at least part-time, so I started working with a youth group. And that pastor didn't just have me work with the youth group. He would take me out and take me fishing. We'd go fishing. And he'd just talk about stuff. We never, I never remember us sitting down and him telling me, this is how you do ministry, and having meetings week after week. What did he do? He just spent time with me, and I watched him. 
and I watched what he did. And God used that to train me, to change me, that so much so that just a few months ago I was thinking about my schedule that I kept now for 25 years as a lead pastor of a church, and it's the same schedule that he kept. He would take off Monday, which I try to do, take off Monday, and he would take half a day Friday, and he would work part of a day Saturday, and he would work Sunday, and, and I look at my schedule, and I say, that's, wow, it's weird. That's what I do. Why do I do it? Because that's where I learned it. Listen to this. The Lord said to Aaron, Moses' brother, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he'd commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron, then listen to what happens next. They bring together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they had heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bow down and worship. So remember, Moses goes to God and says, I can't do this. So God says, I'm going to send you a helper, Aaron. Now, here's what's interesting. Aaron speaks with Moses, we see, two times, and then we don't hear from him anymore. I think that Aaron was there to support Moses. Aaron probably shared a couple times. Moses probably talked to Aaron, and then Aaron shared, and then Moses thought, this is way too much work. And then he started sharing. You see that Moses steps up and starts sharing. What happened? God sent Aaron to give him a boost. And then you see the Israelites, 400 years, building who knows what, pyramids, sphinxes, all kind of things. And they said, God hasn't forgotten about you. And immediately God was preparing them for the next step. What was going to happen? The exodus from Egypt. You know, we have people in our church like Robin with Grief Share who do a great job of helping people take those next steps in their journey. We have people in our church, in small groups, that when somebody's struggling, they'll pull you aside. Hey, you doing okay? Is anything I can do? Folks that are connected to one another, that when they see that somebody's hurting, they help them. Hey, can I help you through this tough time? We all need those people, and we need to be those people to others. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This word for disciple means pupil. Now, in America, we think of pupil like rose. But it wasn't. And there's another word that, that talks about what this really means. And it's the idea of discipleship is the idea of following in the dust of the master. What does that mean? It means as you're following somebody, you see what they're doing. When Jesus taught the disciples, much of what he taught was on the way, on the way, on the way. Is there anybody that you are encouraging spiritually to grow? Is there anybody that you're teaching to obey? You know, Jesus said it wasn't just this idea of discipleship was not just to fellowship with one another. It was also to teach each other what does God's word say and how do we Obey it. Why? Because when we know that obedience brings blessing. We want to do what God wants us to do. Now, it may not be blessing like the world thinks is blessing. But when you can walk in joy and peace through obedience, God changes you and others. Let me give you an example. Kristen's dad would come up to me sometimes, and he would do the Pillsbury Doughboy on me. You ever had anybody do the Pillsbury Doughboy on you? If you're chubby at all, people love to do that. Woohoo! Woo! Pillsbury Doughboy. And he'd come up and he'd poke my belly. And what he was saying without saying it is, put on a little weight there, aren't you? Which is always encouraging. But let me tell you why he was doing that. Because he didn't want me to die young and leave his daughter alone. He just wanted me to know, please take care of yourself. Listen, as Christians, we're responsible to each other. Not to get on to each other, to aggravate each other, but the truth is that sometimes we need a little reminder. We need a little encouragement. We need a little refocus, because truthfully, on our own, we all get focused on the wrong thing. So we need each other. 
And sometimes there's people, just by saying thank you, or just by being appreciative, or just by seeing what God's doing, we realize, oh, that's so much bigger than what I'm focused on today. So let me ask you this next challenge question. Who are you preparing? Is there anybody that you're preparing for next step? You're helping them walk through something. You're helping them through maybe a a part of their journey that's difficult, or you're training them, or you're helping them in the next step. And then finally, number three, people partner with us in God's work. I love, we've got cards now for Steve. Steve's in the back there. We're wearing matching uniforms today. Sorry, Rodney. Steve wore the matching uniform today. And um, Steve has been stepping up and helping with different things. He shares the message focus at some of our services like Rodney does here. And the truth is that Steve, over time, has been saying, I feel like God's calling me to this. And so we've been talking about different service projects. And we decided uh, this last week, Steve now has cards because he's going to be going out of his way to create service opportunities for each of us in the church. We've already signed up with Keep Brevard Beautiful to keep this road clean, put one of our signs out there, something for us to do. Work projects, blood drives, can drives, and we're going to call it the action team. And I cannot wait for the first video. The A team. I can't wait. I'm excited about it. So Steve will be leading that up. And Steve, we're proud of what God's doing and how he's going to continue to do that in you. Now listen, most of you don't know this. Billy Graham met with every president since World War II. Did you know that? Every single one of them. Billy Graham preached to hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Maybe even millions. Billy Graham became a Christian. Many of you may not know this. He went to a tent revival with Billy Sunday. And he and his friend just decided to go. And they showed up and it was full. And they started to leave. And a deacon that was there said, wait a second. I'll find a seat for you guys. And took them up front and sat them right in the front. Billy Graham became a Christian that night. Can I tell you a secret? We have no idea who that deacon was. But just their service, just going out of their way to help somebody, some kid they didn't even know, has changed the world. You never know when you go out of your way for somebody else, and you go out of your way to be a a blessing, what change you could make in the world. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, and they said, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Let my people go, so they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. I won't let Israel go. So Pharaoh's looking at all these temples. Pharaoh himself was called a god, one of many. And Pharaoh said, Wait a second. Your people work for me, and you're telling them, you're telling me their god is powerful? Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to work! Exclamation point. Sounds like my dad. I remember hearing that a lot. <clears throat> then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are starting, stopping them from working. Now, Moses, you remember, did not want to go back. Moses, you remember, did not want to share. So what did God do? God gave him Aaron to go with him to stand before, at that time, the most powerful man in the world that could have wiped them out in a second. Why? Because for them to do God's will, Moses needed a little help getting started. We all need that sometimes. We need that person that that partners with us That person that, by the way, if you didn't see it, it was Exodus 5, 1 through 5. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if that made it to the screen or not. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, it says this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 is the next verse. Therefore, the Bible says, encourage one another and build each other up as in fact you are doing. This word for encourage is the same word that we use for the Holy Spirit. It's paraclete. It's somebody who comes alongside. It's an advocate. It's an attorney. That's the only positive attorney joke I've ever heard, by the way. That was great. 
It's an attorney, somebody who comes beside us to encourage us. Who are you walking beside to encourage? Because the truth is, if you do life alone, you're lonely. You'll get tired. You'll get exhausted. I'll never forget, in the hardest time of my life, so many people came along beside me. But I specifically remember Harold Brantley coming out and visiting me and saying, Eric, this is what you need to do. Eric, you need to hang on to that. Eric, you don't need to worry about those people. Eric, you need to focus on this. And came along beside me and said, we're going to walk through this together. Who are you walking with? See, a lot of times we say, well, I wish I had somebody to walk with me. And then I say, but who are you walking with? Because people don't just appear out of nowhere. Every once in a while, somebody will say to me, you know, when I was sick, nobody brought me soup, and I'm so mean. Can I tell you what I say? When did you bring somebody soup? Well, well, no, I'm the one who's sick. No, no, before you were sick, who did you bring soup to? Well, no one. So why do you expect somebody to bring you soup? We want other people to help us, but we don't think, oh, maybe I need to help them. Listen, God has called all of us to partner together, to paraclete together to encourage each other by walking alongside so the final question is this how should you partner with others some of you are exhausted physically mentally emotionally spiritually i want to encourage you moses did not leave israel alone he had others to help him and you're not alone But you have to go out of your way. No matter how much you've been hurt, no matter what's happened to you, you have to go out of your way to begin to build relationships with others so we can do this journey together. God will send healing helpers to walk you through whatever you're walking through now and in the future. And we're here for you and we love you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. If you're watching online, you can send me a note, an email. We believe that Jesus is the only way to God. We believe that we're all sinners. We all fail. I don't have a whole lot of people argue with me about that one. We all fail. We all falter. And because of that, we needed Jesus to take our sins. And the only way to do that was by sacrificing himself for us. Very rarely will anyone die, even for a good person. But God died for us, even while we were yet sinners. And so the Bible says that he died on a cross and that when you and I say to Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I know that you died on a cross and rose again to pay for my sins and I trust you. And when we do that, the Bible says that he takes our sin, our mess ups, and he brings us forgiveness. He cleans the slate for us. He gives us his righteousness for our filth. If you want to do that today, you can do that today. And as a Christian, don't forget what he's done for you because when you go to help others, realize what God has done for you as you bless others. Normally we have our time of giving now. We're, we're just You can give on your way out here. And if you're watching online, you can give um, online. We have several ways you can give. But we're going to close in prayer today. Thank you for being here. Father, thank you for the people who've helped us all through our lives. People who walked with us through tough times. People who lifted us up and encouraged us. People who taught us. People who provided for us. People who partnered with us in difficult times to make a difference. Father, I thank you for a church where we're seeing that more and more. People taking ministry and partnering with others and giving their gifts in order to help others to grow in you. Father, I pray we would be a church that is known for being a lighthouse in this community and being a blessing, not just here, but to others. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Lord, I pray also for those who maybe have struggled getting back in relationships, that Father, today, through your spirit, you would give them the strength to take those next steps of faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.